roots in classical music from Europe. Mm. People into groups like Magma and the work of Fast, were they all aware of that type of music and say the work of the Harry Parch? I don't know think I would be aware of Harry Parch. Certainly Magma, you can hear that, that they actually borrowed tunes from Stravinsky and East European folk music. And Karl Orff is a very strong influence, I would say, on that. I mean, definitely Vanda was, was very much in, in this tradition. Um, Faust, they were really more part of the more avant-garde electronic concrete music scene in Germany, and the kraut rock groups, so-called, that were working at that time. But yes, they, I think all the groups, all the groups, in Rio and most of nearly all the groups that are distributed by the community are all very conversant mainstream European classical Can I just ask you something like you know take people like Stockhausen and people might take influences from Stockhausen and Bartok and people like that. Mm. Does it is it a two way process? Is there any sign that the actual the class so called classical composers are starting to take anything back? No recommended back. No it's not. It's it's interesting you should ask that because Michael Gerson's article in the New Quarter is about, partly about this very subject. There has been a very much one-way movement. Um, the classical world doesn't seem to be interested in rock music generally. And if it is, it's interested only in the, in the commercial, superficial aspects of it, and taking elements here and there. I don't think they really know what's happening in there. On, on our fringe. There are a few composers who do. I mean, I've had correspondence from some composers who are quite keen on that stuff. People like um, Otto Lane in America and uh, George Katzer and uh, Louis Andres and Keith uh -huh. But apart from that, I think they keep themselves in their, in their world. And, you know, in order to find out about the kind of music that we're interested in, you have to really get involved because you won't just trip over in a record store or hear it at somebody's house. You have to, to really get into the whole business. And, and if you're a classical composer and you have a few brushes of pop music on the radio and it all sounds like rubbish to you, you won't look any further. No. You simply won't, won't bother to investigate. And therefore, you won't find what there really is to find. Can I just pick you up on that? You know, you're saying I mean, you won't find it in the local record store. Could you expand on that? Reasons mm. why? Reasons why? Well, it doesn't sell. And record shops take what sells. In the late 60s, when, when experimental music was all the rage, all the big record companies were falling over themselves to sign up any psychedelic acts they could get their hands on because it would sell then. Now it doesn't sell, so nobody's interested in it. The reason it doesn't sell, I suppose, is because the late 60s was a time of affluence and, and security and there's, then there was space for some liberalism. People could have a bit of a fling. But now the stakes are much higher than that and the, and the pressure is on hard. And in such times, people close up. They want things which make them feel secure and they want things that are familiar Right. And they don't have a lot of money to spend anyway, and the role of culture becomes definitely not something else that you have to work at, but something you to, to relax. Right. Um, and, and, and so that when there's no public anymore for such a music, then there's no interest in the shops to, to stock it because it just stays in the shelves. And even if it doesn't stay in the shelves, they think it's going to stay in the shelves. Yeah. And this is obviously part of the problem. That before the public get a chance to choose or not choose, the, the, the distributors have already decided that this stuff isn't going to sell and they won't distribute it. Right. And one of the things that recommended proved, I think, was that, that there, is, there is a public for this music and you can distribute it and it does work. Right. Can I ask you about your experiences with Virgin Records? Because there's a way, like in the 70s, they had a Caroline label. And everything seemed to be towards let Lord Cox will record an album mm. and we'll bring it out. And it all seemed to found after Mike Oldfield a commercial success with Tubular Bells, rather than actually expanding any sort of radical music, it actually seemed to formularise what Virgin Records were going to go into. How did Henry Cow find? Well, Henry Cow signed with Virgin because we thought it was the best thing to do. And really, there wasn't much of a tradition at that time of groups 
putting out their own records and having their own labels. We didn't really occur to us. Well, it occurred to us that we thought Virgin is a progressive company and we signed them. But of course, they they were progressive only insofar as Branson wanted to corner the market in a, in, a, in a commodity that he could afford to corner the market in. He couldn't compete with the big boys on his own ground. And so he took this waning scene of progressive music and he picked up an old city. But I mean, he went for all the ex off machine members, actually. Old field played with Kevin Ayers. Right. He went for Kevin Ayers. They tried for Robert White, who they got eventually. They signed David Allen and Gong. And they signed us largely on the recommendation of David Allen and uh, Ian Donald, who worked for the enemy at that time. And as soon as they had the hit with Tubular Bells, they realized that um, they didn't have to stay in the ghetto anymore and they could start to expand. And so then they started to try and sign up bigger groups for more money. And they slowly dropped all the old people anyway. And we had a lot of problems getting out of that country. Right. Right, can I move on and ask you, um, what do you see the aims of recommended being at the moment? Same as always, just to gather together all of the kind of stuff that we're interested in and we think that people that like what we like will be interested in from all over the world and then send it out, distribute it, you know, to support the producers that are making the music right. and, to, and to put them in touch with the public and to inform a public of what there is, what exists. Because even if you look, you won't find most of that stuff in the shop. And if you do find it in the shop, it's because we put it there. Yeah. It's recommended, it's distributed. You know, we bring in records from Japan, New Zealand, and Mexico, far flung places from groups who maybe have made only 400, 500 copies of their records. A hundred of them, 200 of them come to London. Right. Is that happening worldwide as well? Pretty much. I mean, there are places that we don't cover, and third world countries, of course, where this, this whole this culture doesn't doesn't run. You know. But okay. yes, otherwise it's it's very broad. I mean, I would say recommended is 75, 80 percent outside England, and the stuff that we distribute, 80 percent of it goes outside the country. Right. And just ask as well, within England, within the London branch, how does recommended actually operate? Well, since now it operates in, a, in, a, in divisions. I mean, it began with just Nick Hobbs and I, and we ran everything. As it expanded, so more people came and it got more divided. How it works at the present time is that the distribution and the mail order operate as one kind of conglomerate, and there are four people who work doing that. And I run the record company and manufacture the record do right. all that sort of thing and can help out with the distribution. I mean I still basically select the records that we distribute and I still write the mail on the catalogue and right. select the records that we're going to put out the mail on because recommended means that means I recommend it. So there has to be something that I do. But I can manage to run the labels even being out of the country working with this musical because they can all be done in short bursts of work, whereas distribution means permanently being around and dealing with distributors and people on telephone. Right. You know, you're talking about um, the expansion into making records, yourselves actually pressing mm. their own records. Why, how did that come about? Well, at the same time that we set up Recommended, I also set up Ray Records to put out the first art bed because I didn't ever want to have anything to do with record companies. So the precedent was already there. I mean, we effectively already had an own record company. And then, partly because it was possible to make our own record company, and we wanted to be able to put records out. And partly because I didn't want to be so dependent on the residents, because we, a lot of our turnover was their records, and we wanted to be dependent on ourselves. We started the label with the fast records, which actually established this. Right. OK. What problems does recommended face? Financial, serious, always serious. It's very hard to continue. I mean, the, the people who work for distribution take really minimal amount of money, and I don't take anything. In fact, I have basically have supported recommending all through the years by not taking, not taking any royalties that I would get if I 
that was a legitimate kind of way of by putting money into in times of crisis like this year and we were robbed. So that's the main problem, really, is it's just managing to keep everything going. Otherwise, we don't have such problems. I mean, we have internal kind of problems like how to get more distribution, how to get more yeah. sorts of things, but that's normal, I think. Okay. And then finally, what keeps you going? I don't know. Couldn't tell you. Couldn't answer that question. I mean, it's something that has to be done. It needs to be done. It needed to be done. And nobody did it. And then we did it. And if we stop doing it, probably nobody will do it. And it's got to be done. Right. And we're already doing it, so, you know, it would be too much. And anyway, I'm damned if I'm going to give up after, after eight years. We said basically we couldn't do it, and we did it, and we're still doing it. And if I have my way, we're going to continue to do it. Because it will be a disaster for the groups, all those little groups who would no longer have any kind of distribution, who wouldn't be able to make records anymore. A disaster for the, for the people that rely on us to kind of find all those records and keep them in touch. Right. And we, we, go, we just go back eight or ten years, and some people... Okay.